Hi, I'm Bill DeYoung. This is the St. Pete Catalyst and the Catalyst Sessions. You're looking at two people right now, and one of them, I'm here to tell you, is pretty smart. And to quote my old pal, Tom Petty, it's not me. Please say hello to Dr. Brandy Stark, who is an academic, an artist. She has three graduate degrees. She's an author. She keeps pugs. She has another uh, field of interest, which we're going to talk about, but she's a resident of St. Petersburg, and she's absolutely brilliant. Hello. Hi, how are you doing today? You're in the Art Loft building, not far from where uh, I am speaking. So we're kind of across the street from each other in this COVID. I know, I, I am absolutely amazed. As I said, I, I waved to you on my way in today. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. You, yeah, you told me that you're, out, you're usually out walking one of your pugs and that you are a, you're a pug person. I know dachshund people and a friend of mine has a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, Boston Terriers. People get very specific to their dogs. What is it about pugs for you? Well, I explain to people that pugs are part cat, part canine, and part human. Um, they're not dogs. They're definitely <laughs> something yeah. else. And um, I, I'm just a third generation pug person. Uh, it, uh -huh. it runs through my mother's line. Uh, her mother and, and my mother and I have them. And I actually have what's known as a pug grumble. So I have a group of pugs. Uh, so I've, and I, today I have with me my puggle set, maybe why you didn't recognize me, because uh, <laughs> she's a part beagle, part pug. So, uh, but she was a she's rescue. She's part of the rumble. And, yeah. um, that's right. <laughs> she, I love uh, that. she is a handful. I'm going to try to use there that conversation today. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, you know, we got into pug rescue in 2000 and uh, my mother uh, kind of specialized in the older pugs and um, I've taken in several elders and some handicapped pugs over the years and we just, just love them. They're just, they're little people and they're always with you. Aren't and they always uh, snorting? Are they, they're very, they're very yes. snorty, aren't they? They are. And in fact, right now, um, my know. favorite thing, yeah, they snore at night. Uh, one of my favorite things right now is using TikTok, which I guess is still here, and they have a synthesizer app or a synthesizer filter. So I record my pugs barking with the synthesizer and it becomes this beautiful melody. It's so wow. much better than actually hearing them bark. But I, I don't know why I'm obsessed with this right now, but I'm like, it's music. It's music. So. Well, you but are, as, as, I, as I said in the beginning, you are a woman of many talents and abilities and uh, I, I wondered because you, you are a fine artist and also an academic, and uh, I guess that's that's a nice word to say that you teach. Where do you teach these days? Um, right now, uh, State College, Florida, uh, uh -huh. Manatee. So I'm over in Bradenton, and I'm still teaching religion and humanities. Uh -huh. um, I've taught pretty much everywhere. I've been doing this about 20 years and at one point was full-time faculty, but uh, wanted to dedicate a little more time to the art. So yeah. I went to a part-time status, but um, I love it. And um, it, it's just a very different feel. Uh, Manatee is just a little different county and it's kind of nice to get out of just St. Pete all the time. But do you, do, you, um, do you go down there? Or are you doing this all virtually? Are you, you, you um, right now, I have one day of classes. They were kind enough to give me back to back. So on Fridays, if you see me on Friday, either I'm trying to get over there or trying to get back, and I, I'm just totally dead. I come home and I just kind of face plant into the bed, and that's it. But, um, but it's, you know, I took a little bit of time off from straight teaching. Um, I just did a couple of virtual classes, and I really missed it. I, uh, I'm also a third-generation educator, <laughs> so my mother's side. Uh, both my parents taught uh, university level, and um, like I said, I've been doing uh, uh, higher ed uh, since 2000. I can't believe I'm that old now, but and it's so weird because I see my students now, and they have kids and careers, and I'm like, no, no. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> So um, it's, it's been really interesting, but it's afforded me a unique look at uh, a lot of different things. So I can look at the fine arts, I can talk about the humanities, I can talk about the value of art. Um, and then at the same time, I can, uh, I can do academic research into the subject of my love, which we'll talk about shortly, right. um, as long as I don't see they officially exist, uh, but that they have a role to play in culture. I'm okay with the topic, and so are, mm -hmm. are my uh, administration. So um, I, it's hard to believe I've been doing that since 97, but <laughs> I have. So. You've been here since 92, I read. Where are you from originally? Yes. Uh, actually, before that, I was just over in Lutz, <laughs> so it was oh, over across a big, the bay. A big hike, right? 
Oh, yeah, huge. Uh, the irony, of course, that I lived right next to USF Tampa, and then we moved over here, and then I had to commute over to USF Tampa. Oh, but, right. uh, but I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, but uh, moved over here when I was, um, I think I was four at the time. So I consider myself Floridian, pretty much. Um, you know, except for that birth thing. I've been oh, educated yeah. here, yeah. culture here. I can stand the madness here. <laughs> so we're, we're just doing it. Well, let me leap into this. You're known essentially for these these wire works, these pieces that you do with with wire. Mm -hmm. And I, to be honest, you know what I read. I I can't I can't remember ever seeing somebody who could take you know found objects and and a, and a welding rod and a creative spark and make something cool out of it. Yeah, convenient. Hold it, hold it for a second. <laughs> I'm actually labeling these right now because we're getting ready for, uh, of course, art season and and the other season are up right now. But this is a piece that I made, the technology mermaid, and this is the joy of having pugs that I can walk. I walk all over St. Pete with them, and you find the coolest stuff. So. This is a, a circuit board that was left out and of course made the tail. And then I've got some jewelry here that I broke up and then she's got the wire body. Uh, I do a ton of mermaids, but I've done dragons and um, I have a, a headless horseman. Um, I just, you know, I just do it. It's great, it's fun. It's cathartic because I can bend this wire. <laughs> so. Why is it cathartic? I mean, is that I come home at the end of the day and I just want to, I just want to mold something or? You know. Yeah, um, I was actually an undergraduate. I took a, a course in sculpture yeah. and um, I didn't like a lot of the different things we tried, but uh, at the end, the professor said, well, try, try metal. And so I did. And, um, and it worked. I, I was able to bend it. Uh, and he said the basic shape of a torso is a triangle, uh, make something. I think I had exasperated the poor man at this point. And so uh, the first piece I made was a, a merman. Uh, and then I made a dragon for my mother for Mother's Day and a centaur. Um, and I started showing uh, in 1997 at a, uh, back when the art bloom was starting at a gallery called Tweeters. And um, I actually sold out before the show opened. And I just, um, I mean, I only had probably seven or eight works at that point. I had to figure out how to buy welding rods. I hadn't, you know, there were no mentorship programs. The arts were very loosely organized and uh, it was, it was very much a learning process. So, um, but I've just loved it ever since. And it's kind of neat because I feel like I've finally gotten a brand. I mean, people will see my art and they'll say, oh, I've seen you, or I bought one of your works 10 years ago. And I'm like, cool, buy some more, <laughs> but you know, but it's so exciting. And I have one person that said, uh, your work is one of my favorites. I've had it, uh, for 17 years and it's still on my coffee table. And I was just like, wow. I mean, it's just, it's very, um, it's rewarding that way. It really so, is. What's your website? Let's let's put that out here. Your art site. Sure. Um, it's very simple. It's uh, www.bstarkart.com. Mm -hmm. And so that is online. And apparently I need to update a little bit of it. I try. I try so hard. But you're one of those, you know, when you're one person, everything. <laughs> so, yeah. but I mean, it. You've um, been in galleries. You've had shows. you won awards. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, oh, uh, yeah, I've, I've been very lucky. Um, and, and the nice thing about a studio is I can at least put my awards up, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. So oh, it, uh, nice. my favorite shows, um, I have a, a life size piece at home and she was shown in the Dolly. She showed at the Dolly. I was one of yeah. the Zodiac um, selections. Uh, she's shown at Florida Craft Art downstairs. Um, she was at the Seminole Women's Art Show, uh, the Art of Women. At Bay. Um, oh, and she was in Et Cultura. And this piece is about 14 feet stretched out. So the only way I can transport her is in the back of a Miata, which is interesting because she sits head down in the Miata and her tail goes across the trunk. And uh, I seatbelt her in and I drive very carefully. Straight like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, it was interesting going across the Howard Franklin, but I, you know, I stayed in the right lane and just took right. my time and, and everybody was very, very nice about it. But <laughs> yeah, you it's an interesting about, you, know, you You do some of your sculptures are, are uh, like mythological characters and things like that. So I, I wonder, yes. how, you know, your other interest in, in religious studies and, and of course the paranormal stuff that we're going to talk about, how that imbues your art? Um, or does it not always? It does. It when I first started doing art, I found one of my old articles way back in the day when I was first being uh, 
first showing. Yeah. And I remember that part of the reason why I wanted to create these pieces, the education part of me has been in here forever. Uh, I wanted to be a professor when I was 15 years old. And, and so I was very excited. Uh, but the art was actually a way for me to talk about some of these obscure characters that um, mythology holds and kind of present them in a new way. Uh, one of my very favorite pieces to show is a piece called Leucothea. And Leucothea is a minor goddess in the Odyssey. But if it wasn't for her, Odysseus would not have survived to tell his story. So, you know, the beginning of the tale is that essentially Odysseus is in the ocean and he's drowning because his, his last ship has sunk. And uh, as he is drowning, the sea goddess comes up to him and Leucothea used to be human. And because she remembers being human, um, she sees him and she has compassion and she gives him her veil. And her veil acts like the life preserver and uh, he is buoyed up and he's saved by this. And I mean, she's this minor, minor goddess, nobody knows of her. And yet here she is and she has this part in this epic. She saves the hero and she's there. She's that divine figure when he needs her. So, um, you know, I started studying the mythologies when I was in third grade. I went to an all girls <laughs> private Catholic school over in Tampa, but they had a great religion section. And so I would go over to the high school section and I would start reading the mythology. And it really had an impact because I ended up with degrees in history and classics as an undergrad. And then I ended up with religious studies, humanities and liberal studies literature uh, for graduate. And then I did finally end up with a PhD and it, um, I mean, this love, this interest, it's, um, it just really, it's fun to do through the art. And it's, it's interesting because people, they, they really respond to it. I'm very lucky there that they respond to the wire. Um, I remember a very early piece that I made, a mother bought it for her child and the child, it was actually a merman, but gender and wire sculptures, eh, you know, back in the old days, you know, I now know about wider chests and shoulders and square hips and that sort of thing. But, uh, but the little girl decided to name it something feminine. It was a she, and then she named it God. <laughs> what? I mean, the mother actually sent me this email and they, they put it up over this nightlight and this little girl just loved it, just felt like it was a guardian figure. And I, I mean, yeah, how do you, uh, how do you let go of that? I mean, it's just, um, yeah, I mean, it's just it, fantastic. It's like a child could see something that even you, you couldn't see or, or intend. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 I think so. About, I did want to talk with you about Spirits of St. Petersburg, which Absolutely. is the organization that you founded, or I guess you co-founded. Um, and it's a paranormal investigation. Do you call it a society or a group or a company? This is what group. you do. Okay. Yes. Um, it's a, so I do the teaching and then I do the art and then yeah. uh, kind of my, I consider it kind of a community service. So the Spirits is an LLC. And I did that in 2004 in part because that was when paranormal investigation was coming out on TV. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really felt that we needed people to feel like we could be accountable um, because paranormal investigation, I someday I'm going to write a paper on how it's kind of become a pseudo religion in some ways. It's not just a pseudo science. It, it has these undertones. And I mean, I thought the academics was a tough world. I thought the arts were a tough world. Paranormal investigation is a tough world. I mean, that is political and territorial. So oh, yeah. we became an LLC, but uh, we really don't charge for anything, uh, at least not investigations. We try to kind of do some fundraisers and I wrote some books to kind of raise some money for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I, I have to file taxes every year and we pay for our LLC status. But um, I've been doing that also, uh, the art and the, the paranormal investigation kind of dovetailed uh, and it actually tied into the education as well. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I started writing papers on the role of ghosts in ancient cultures, uh, the first paper being the role of ghosts in Homer and the in the ancient Greek bard. Yeah. And um, it was selected to be presented at an academic forum. And, you know, it was my very first forum, first time I ever did it. And I was just, you know, it was another one of those things where um, Ghosts actually used to scare the bejesus out of me, but intellectually, you can see where they play a role in culture. So for Homer, 
the ghost figure becomes uh, something that gets tied to an underworld, uh, which is important because before that, the Greeks believed that the ghost was tied to the grave. And that meant that if the ghost was tied to the grave, you had to maintain the grave. You could never leave because you had to maintain your ancestors. So this notion of an underworld where ghosts could go and then ghosts could visit you in your dreams. They didn't have to be tied to a grave anymore. You know, this was kind of this revolutionary idea for the Greeks. And uh, Homer knew it. He was proud of it. Um, and so I started kind of doing these papers. And then I started discovering local urban legends and St. Pete. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I had an art show <laughs> in October. It was an early art show. Uh, I think it was in 99 or so. I had already started doing paranormal investigations on my own. Uh, I had found a couple of online groups of uh, the investigators from the 70s and 80s. So they mentored me a bit. Uh, that this was the burgeoning of the interweb, right? The internet. So I could say, you know, what does this mean? And uh, I still remember one of my first experiences with this online group is that I was still using a film camera. So if you remember those, you push a button and there's film. Oh, and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, and yeah. I could not, I actually could not afford a digital camera for years because <laughs> I was in school for so long. But uh, I got what I thought was an image. I was in a haunted place and I took this picture and there's this image of a female and the place was haunted by a woman. And I was so excited. And I actually had to find somebody to help me scan the picture to get it online. And I showed it to this group. And one of them was a, a professional photographer and he said, oh, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but that's a double image. That's a double exposure. It's not a ghost. Your film. Yeah. Oh, and I just remember being so devastated, but that was so important because they were able to kind of help me get a better foundation. Oh, sure. Uh, with investigation, because I see a lot of people today are, are TV educated, and um, I have I have issues with that. Um, you know, there's become something called a para celebrity. Um, and I just, I, I, yeah, there are people whose goal is to become a para celebrity, and I, I keep thinking. But, but well, you you've adapted Peters. all of this, as you say, to St. Petersburg, and and, and yeah. you have, you said there there. I think you told me there were two books. I, I see different things with your names on it. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, yeah I they been are busy. books. Yay, two books. Okay, is there yeah, something so, exceptional about St. Petersburg and Pinellas County? I mean, is there more activity here that you've discovered than other you know, places? I really thought. I was going to be doing ghost investigation for like five years, you know, you know, 97. Then, you know, I, I did this talk at this art gallery and I had started looking at urban legends. And the first book that I read was something called the Tampa Bay triangle. And that was by mm -hmm. captain Bill Miller. First thing I ever found on the local tri-county area and it had aliens and, you know, UFOs and mm -hmm. ESP and spontaneous human. I mean, it had everything, but it had ghost stories. And so um, I actually started talking and researching those. And the more yeah. I did, the more I found. And um, St. Pete is a, a very unique area. Um, you know, culturally, we kind of have the Midwestern flavor. Um, we have a, a mix of, you know, we're, we're kind of from the 1800s. So we have some of that old time, very Southern culture that kind of existed at that point. Um, we have urban legends that are, are kind of by community. And, um, you know, our, our historic buildings are, they remain pretty haunted. Um, it, it is interesting. And so, you know, here I am all of these years later, and I, I still, you know, we're still out there doing this. And I keep thinking, wow, you know, you think you've run out of ghosts. But people that they tell you uh, that you hear about and, and write them. I mean, do you, you do investigations? Do you go yeah. out and, and I mean, yes. So how it, how uh, it all we, works. And, yeah. We have come up with kind of a system in which um, I am the contact. And if somebody contacts me, we'll usually do an online interview of sorts. I've got a form to fill out. Uh, there's emails or chat, depending. Um, I usually follow up with a phone call, but at that point, I am the only person that has any information. I have a researcher who is not in the investigation, but she'll do research beforehand to send to me. Right. Um, I then put out um, a call to my investigators, and these are folks that we have done public record checks, and you'd be surprised to apply sometimes, so, you know. Oh, okay. uh, but but we've done you know public record checks and made sure that you know there's nothing there, um, and then we ultimately end up um, 
I give them a crossroad and I'll say, we've got an investigation for such and such a date. Uh, I usually keep it for the early evening to early night. Mm -hmm. um, this is the approximate location, but they can't research it. So if I'll say it's 22nd and 4th Street North, oh, for example. Yeah. So, but they have an idea of the drive. Uh, a couple hours ahead of time, um, I will give them the address. Uh, we meet up, we go in together. I sit with the homeowner, they go in uh, through the house on their own. So they'll have equipment. Uh, sometimes folks claim sensitivity so that they can sense something yeah. and they'll walk through the house. Um, the homeowner and I kind of sit down I make sure all the paperwork's in order, that everything's in there. Um, we've actually had a couple cases every now and again where a homeowner gets really nervous and they try to kind of help the ghost along, unfortunately. So uh, like one time a m mysterious can of food manifested and I, it, it, it it was the homeowner so you know but i sit with the homeowners and we talk and i try to allay their fears um and then they the team comes back and talks to me and talks to us and i kind of literally type it verbatim uh we do double checks in the hot spots we'll do evps video recordings um you know we really try to focus on the areas where the activity is the most and then at the very end i will talk to them about the homeowner uh, the report the research and the homeowner becomes part of that dialogue. So we really try to keep it, um, you know, kind of as cold as possible. Um, I have actually had folks who volunteered non-haunted houses just to kind of throw folks off. Uh, and I remember one case that we were investigating of a non-haunted house and, and we did our normal procedure. Um, and at the end, you know, my investigators came to me and they're, and they're like, we found absolutely nothing in here. And then one of them piped up a sensitive and she said, um, this next door has all sorts of activity oh boy and we did find out later that the house next door the person the homeowner actually had stage four cancer and was was actually in hospice care at that time you know i mean this was something that i i didn't even know i mean none of us knew and it was one of those that's things where and you just kind of sit back and you think wow that's that's really cool i mean what do you do this um, saturday is the world's largest ghost hunt uh, yes. And, and you have an event at Miralek Park, uh, which is yes. at what, seven o'clock, I think. Tell what's yes. going to happen there. Tell me about Miralek Park and why you're doing an event there. So, uh, normally for the world's largest ghost hunt, this is our third year doing it. Uh, normally, the ghost hunt actually has a program that they do, et cetera. Um, but with COVID 19, we have some issues, you know, obviously being inside. And normally the building that we've done this in is, is actually the studio is, is actually Art Lofts. It's a building from 1916. And there are a few folks that might be hanging out here. So, um, but this year with COVID-19 and kind of all of that questionability, um, the world's largest ghost hunt is not doing an official program, but they said still do the ghost hunt. It's, it's part of the national day of ghost hunting in the United States. So, okay. We kind of looked around and one of the hot spots in this area is Mirror Lake. So um, what we're doing is uh, we're keeping it very short. It's just an hour, but um, it is this part is open to the public. Uh, folks have questions or they want to experience something uh, like they want to know the history. They want to try out equipment. Uh, they, they're welcome to meet us. Um, but Mirror Lake actually has an urban legend that says that there was a young woman who was killed there and that on the night and I've heard of the full moon, also the new moon, and then no moon mentioned whatsoever, but at night, uh, you will see her walking into the lake, that you see the shadowy figure walk into the lake, and then she appears on the other side. And um, I did a lot of research, and Mirror Lake, number one, is very old. It's a natural water source. We know the Tokabagan were there. We know the Conquistadors were there. We know that uh, Roosevelt and the Rough Riders watered their horses there. Mirror Lake was the original city reservoir in the 1920s until about the 1950s. It was the heart of downtown. And then it turns out that there were some people who died there. So uh, I actually have an eyewitness who saw, and this was very unfortunate, but uh, there was a young woman um, who had been killed there and uh, her body was dumped in the, in the lake and she was actually working in the, in the federal building. And she actually watched the police kind of uh, the crime scene as they pulled the body out and they, they marked mm. the crime scene. You're gonna uh, talk about been... all of these things Saturday. Oh, yes, there. yes. And in fact, uh, it is a chapter in this book. Uh, so I don't even have to remember everything. I can just read the chapter, right. uh, which is pretty neat. But there have been, um, there's been a suicide, there's been uh, accidental deaths. 
Um, there's areas around the lake. Uh, so the former St. Pete High School, which is now uh, St. Pete Condominium uh, building is alleged to be haunted. Uh, the library allegedly has ghosts, uh, possibly of one of the vagrants who died in the area. You know, so we've kind of got this really cool history. You know, even if we don't find anything, I don't think a lot of people know the history of Mirror Lake itself. History and is so fascinating, I, isn't it? The history of this city. Uh, I've been writing a lot about specific parts of history. Unbelievable stuff. Oh my God, St. Pete, I mean, we are so historic. We're at the beginning of the airline industry. We had, you know, we had baseball very early on. We had Babe Ruth, we had Lou Gehrig's. I mean, it's just, yeah. it, it is such a phenomenal history as you dig through it. Um, I, I just, I don't know, I keep having fun with it. And um, so with Mirror Lake, we, we do want to talk about the history. We're going to let folks try to see if they can find anything. Yeah. Uh, we are trying to keep it safe. We have asked folks, uh, you know, we want to be safe. So social distancing, uh, where there's no social distancing, you know, of course, bring your mask. Yeah. Um, this will also yeah. be aired in conjunction. It'll be live stream. So if people don't want to come out, they can still see what's going on. And it's also in conjunction with a local science fiction convention called Necronomicon. Uh, this, uh, I think, is the 41st year, and Necronomicon is a literary sci-fi convention that I've sp spoken at for since 98. Gosh, I am so old, but okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they're going to live stream. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, like, I look back at all these dates, and I'm like, oh, wait, it's 2020, but okay. So that's this okay. weekend as well, the Necronomicon. Yes. Okay. And it's actually free this year. It is online. Um, I will be doing a panel on ghosts in uh, quarantine, which is, you know, I've, I've been doing that for the past few months and kind of getting yeah. input from people. Um, yeah. There is a second half to the world's largest ghost hunt that takes place, but it's, it's 8.30 to 9.30 and it's live stream only for the public. From Albert uh, Witt, of, right, from the airport. Yes. yes. We have a group of about five people who are, are, officially in and again albert witted is privately owned so i've I, I had somebody who emailed me who said i'm a paranormal investigator can i tag along and i i can't i can't off you know we, we have to go by those yeah. parameters um so what but, what happened out there tell me about now i gotta know the uh, and the, uh, where where the airport is because that's been there since what the 20s or 30s 20s, yes oh my 30. gosh so <laughs> So there's more, there's so much yeah. history. Uh, Albert Wooded is another really cool St. Pete gem. So uh, yes, uh, a lot of folks don't realize that St. Pete actually had like this airport war in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. We had an airport at Wooden Island, also mm -hmm. uh, We had one at Albert Witted, then Clark International shows up, and then TIA, and it's like this whole collision of airports. It's very exciting. Uh, but uh, Albert Witted was a very early one. There was a woman by the name of, um, her last name is Cook, um, and she was very much a, uh, a supporter of aviation, which at that time, of course, is very new. Uh, yeah. So remember that we have Tony Janis, uh, who actually creates the airline industry in St. Yeah. Petersburg with his, his airplane that also kind of skirts the water. Uh, yeah. That's getting a big statue uh, coming up. But yep. so um, because of our connections, she actually really wanted an airport and she willed properly property to uh, create this airport. And she is possibly still there. There's a female presence. Um, there have been a couple of air uh, crashes. There was one um, in which a, a man was uh, flying one of the banners and the banners got caught uh, in the rudder and he crashed and drowned um, actually right off the airport. And there was one other crash. Um, so we're going to check those two areas. But the other thing is that there's a long term employee. Uh, with uh, who had been with Albert Wooded for 25 years, and he actually had a heart attack and died at home, not at the airport, excuse me, but um, his son still works there, and people will actually hear his son, his son in particular, they'll hear him whistle, uh, sometimes they'll see a figure in the distance walk by, uh, and so he might also still be hanging out at the airport, so it's kind of this, uh, it's a unique opportunity, and I'm really, really grateful uh, to the folks uh, to let us in there uh, and to talk about the history again. I mean, uh, I actually had one of my investigators bring photographs of her mother uh, who flew on National Airlines, which was one of the ones that came here. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to figure out if the pictures are actually from Albert Witted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's like, well, 
it's six degrees of everything. I mean, it just oh, turns I, out. Oh, definitely. I see a lot of that too. And, 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 and it's so fascinating that there are so many facets to history uh, that, you know, sometimes you don't even think about. And, and it's just, you, you, you've really caught my, my interest here. And one day I, I want to talk with you about the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, which I actually wrote a book about a long time ago. And, yes. you know, and there's all kinds of stories about that place. That's not, that wasn't the subject of my book, but, you know, it's it fascinating. There is a, there, I actually have a page on it. It's under our Urban Legends page, because that's where I classified it originally. Yeah. Um, and it talks about both the old and the new span. But uh, I actually have people who've written in on seeing a mysterious vanishing figure on the new span. Um, and then, of course, there's the bus uh, incident uh, from yeah. when the span collapsed as well. And that bus is, according to urban legend, it shows up every 10 years on the anniversary of the collapse. And um, it's supposed to go across the, the, the fishing pier that was the old bridge, and then it disappears over the, over the distance as it goes over the bridge. But, um, and of course, it's also alleged to be cursed because they, they tore down uh, Native American middens in this area to build the bridge. Oh, and, sure. and of course that was something that this area, unfortunately, uh, kind of did a lot of. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's even an idea that St. Pete might be haunted because uh, our original streets were made from the shell mounds, uh, the shell middens left behind by the Native Americans. So we took those shells and we made them into the concrete. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> I, I, I think we could we could continue this conversation for hours. We are out of time though, and I, I wanted to remind folks about Saturday's event. It's seven o'clock at Mirror Lake Park, seven to eight p.m. Where where do people meet you? Where do you go over there? Will they just see you? Um, I think yes. Well, I'm going to be wearing a, a lighted, uh, probably jack o' lantern <laughs> strand, so okay. people can see us. Um, I think we are meeting, it's a small enough park that you should be able to see us, but uh, I think we're going to meet on the side with the St. Pete condos. Uh, okay. So we'll try to meet on that side. And um, again, I do encourage people to be cautious, definitely make sure social distancing, all of that stuff we're supposed to be doing. But uh, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm curious to see if anybody picks anything up. Um, it'll be nice to have a, a group to see what kind of things the group picks up and uh, and to have that focus in that area for that time. And the Spirits of St. Petersburg has a Facebook page as well. Is there a website or we just got a yes. Facebook page? Yes, uh, we have a website. Um, it is www.spiritsofstpete.com. I shortened it a little bit. Okay. Um, or just Google Spirits of St. Petersburg. Saturday is the day, seven o'clock near Lake Park. Uh, I think 8.30 is the virtual thing from uh, the virtual thing from, from yeah. uh, the airport. <laughs> Fascinating <laughs> stuff. Dr. Brandy Stark, thank you for being our guest today. Well, Absolute thank you. Pleasure. I appreciate it. This was Absolute. fun. I'll be looking for you in the pugs on the street out here. Walking Please off. do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll, be, we'll be the crazy people wandering out there. <laughs> so. Take care, sweetie. We'll see you soon. Absolutely. Bye.